Hello, and welcome to Therapy Talk. It's a show designed to use the power of Google Plus and YouTube to bring interesting and innovative therapists and those interested in therapy or counseling together to share their work, their thoughts, their ideals with each other. Hi, I'm Neil Brown. I'm a psychotherapist with over 30 years experience and deeply steeped in the theory and practice of family therapy. And family therapy is a systemic way of looking at and understanding the context in which problems form and are healed. In bringing you this show, my desire is to share the wealth of knowledge I've been given with others and to help other innovative professionals share their knowledge and gifts as well. In this way, we can learn, grow, and engage and share together. I am thrilled today to bring you Jeff Moreno. Jeff is a doctor of physical therapy with a specialization in the running athlete. He has a keen eye for deciphering what's going on with an athlete's movement and creating awareness and behavioral adjustments to reverse the effects of injuries and restore healthy movement. Jeff works at Precision Physical Therapy in Aptos, California, as well as with elite athletes and Olympians throughout the world. And I think you're just back from China recently. Ultimately, Jeff has identified what he calls the movement crisis we currently have with our youth. While running and the running athlete have been his focus, his attention is now squarely on creating change at a grassroots level through his organization, Move to Thrive. This is a message whose time has come as people all over the world are stirred and invigorated to help bring what Jeff calls physical literacy back to our youth and our culture. Our program today is being uh, supported and uh, promoted by Robin Holland, my professional coach, and Robin will take your questions, so please ask your questions, and Robin, please join in anytime. Hello, Jeff, how are you today? Great, Neil. I, I really appreciate you having me and uh, letting me discuss um, this this topic of fiscal movement crisis that we have in today's youth. Uh, it's something that I'm extremely passionate about, and um, and if I get really overly excited and start yelling and banging the table, then please forgive me, because <laughs> I have a tendency to get really worked up about this, um, only because I care about it, and I think it's that important to um, for parents to understand, educators to understand, and um, um, the people who make policy um, in our government, state, and local. Um, and I, I think I think it's a big issue, and 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 I really appreciate your time for having me on 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 this um, hangout. Well, we're very excited to have you on, and it's a it's it's an area that's not being talked about, and that's we're going to change that today. So before we get into it, let's talk a little bit about your your background and uh, and how you might have come on to this. You know, when I went to you for physical therapy, it wasn't massage and H-Wave and Electro-Stim, uh, what you did is looked at my running form and gave me each visit a new approach that eventually took the pressure off of those areas that were uh, suffering and started my biomechanics in the right direction and now I'm running without those problems. So tell us a little bit about your background, where it comes from, and uh, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so, so I think first I have to tell you in terms of just my overall core principle is I really truly believe that, that movie cease to move, we cease to exist. It's really that simple. Um, and I, I, I also believe that there is a better way to move than not, um, and we're still learning a lot about this, this process, and, and that process through development, um, the system matures through those first two years of life, but um, that's probably the biggest kind of principle that I have, and with that, with that saying is, what that said is, is, is my, my job as a physical therapist, I truly believe, is to direct the individual, uh, an athlete, an Olympian, or someone who wants to just continue to be active throughout their lifespan, um, and, and direct them in a direction that allows them to achieve um, 
movement for life. Um, so um, it's it's really not we make it complex, and it's really about purely educating the individual and and getting them in a position where they can be successful. And with with regards to with, with regards to their goals and what they're trying to achieve. So um, I have a tendency to be very movement oriented. Um, I don't use a lot of t tools uh, um, that maybe um, physical therapy has used in the past um, because the efficacy of them are, is we're finding is pretty low. And uh, I've found that I can give more bang for the buck, so to speak, by getting a person to move differently and better mm -hmm. in a way to reduce stress to the tissue and allow tissue to heal because tissue is amazing um, and the human body is amazing and if you give it the opportunity and the environment to heal correctly it just does that if you have a scrape on the arm and you don't pick your scab it's gonna heal so it's really no different than that um, and um, whether I'm seeing an elite athlete in China that's going to be in the Olympics or the World Championships or I'm seeing someone who comes in my door and just wants to run a local 5k or just wants to, to walk and not have pain it's not different <laughs> it's it's the human system the human system was made to to heal um, you have to create the environment to do that and and that's what I'm trying to get parents teachers Educator um, and and really the world to understand that um, um, our youth, uh, on a global standpoint, um, this can be done in, in in an educational system that somewhat okay. is is so not. Before we go there, let me just make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. What you're saying is, if I live to a hundred years old, I should be able to use my body effectively throughout those years because so many people will come in they'll say what kind of exercise you do well I used to exercise but you know my knees don't work anymore or you know I got some hip pain so I can't really do that anymore so and what you're saying is well if you actually use your body correctly that you're going you will be able to uh, be, your body will heal those negative things and you'll be uh, you'll, you're good to go 100% I I totally agree with um, with with that statement, and and I firmly and truly believe that, and seen that in, in my clinic um, firsthand. Now, in our culture and our environment, it isn't necessarily conducive, just based on how we live. But um, we can be that way. And the analogy, the analogy I give a lot of my patients is is it's really simple. It's like Putting a tire on the car, and and tires can we can we can we can drive on that tire for quite a long time if our tire is aligned correctly and we're moving in the right direction and what have you. But if I slightly if I take that tire and, and I'm always making a slight left hand turn, things are going to wear out at a per, pretty profound weight pretty quickly, um, um, and the tire is going to eventually blow and it's not going to last as as long as it was. Is there something wrong with the tire? Absolutely not. I, I just we put it in a feel it in our foot or I, we feel it in our knee. So we come into the physical therapist and say, hey, physical therapist, help me with my knee or my foot. Yeah. I just I just put the tire in an environment that isn't conducive to the longevity that it was designed to do. And it's really that simple. Um, it, it's more complex. But, but again, in terms of speaking about it, it really doesn't need to be that complex um, okay. and I want people to understand that um, there are some you go to China their toilets are on the ground there's an 80 year old woman deep squatting to go to the bathroom um, um, some of its cultural and, and that woman lived in an environment where that was a necessity for her to go to the bathroom every single day um, and as a result of that um, um, she continues to squat um, like she did when she was a kid. Um, um, so 
are we do we lose those patterns over time yes we lose them not because we can't do it but because the environment that we're in kind of is not conducive to that sometimes and I think this is the bigger issue that we're going to talk about here in a second but um, I again I truly believe movement is life and if you give the individual the opportunity to to move great things happen uh, um, not only physically but also cognitively and psychosocially, as we, as as you know more than I do. Well, that, that's an extremely helpful and empowering message, Jeff, and I love it. And so let's let's let me ask the question: What is physical literacy? What is that? What does that mean? Yeah, physical literacy is, is physical literacy is is a new term um, coming out these days, and and um, there. There's a lot of countries that have different um, definitions of physical therapy, but really they're saying the same thing. Um, and, and it really is, it's about uh, the ability and confidence and desire to be physically active um, throughout the lifespan. And it's the ability to, to accomplish these fundamental movement skills that we should develop naturally over our, our, our um, developmental time between the ages of zero to 12 um, that should just occur naturally that sometimes don't as a result again of our culture and our environment and not only is it a is the a component of the physical but it also applies um, the psychosocial component to and the cognitive component and so um, it's really multifactorial um, 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 in nature um, and it's a it it's really about allowing the human system uh, an, an environment to to grow up as we were designed to um, with resiliency and and with efficiency and um, and with confidence and ability and desire to continue that throughout our lifespan. Um, if you create an environment where a kid doesn't have that opportunity to be active, or there's an environment where he just doesn't move a lot. Those skills that he needs to like hop, skip, jump, run, squat, turn, roll um, are not going to develop because he this, the system isn't desi isn't giving the opportunity to do that. So, okay. so uh, is, that, that, is that what's happening? And how did you, Jeff? How did you become aware that this is starting to be a problem for our youth. I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is if kids are allowed to be naturally active and they're supported in uh, healthy environments for being active, uh, they're going to do fine. Yes. So you're saying yes. maybe that's not happening. And how did you become aware of that? Yeah. Two stories I'll tell you. The, f the first one, and I'm going to work backwards um, because – it's been something I, I saw for quite a while, um, but I had the opportunity to give a lecture at Stanford University to their sports medicine department. And because my background is in movement and in running, um, it was really um, a, a lecture on the running athlete from, from a higher level standpoint. Mm -hmm. And um, I gave this lecture and, and – uh, the director of athletic training at Stanford, Scott Anderson, who's an amazing human being, and he's one of my colleagues in this this cause now, um, asked me an extremely profound question about three quarters of a way, the way through the lecture, and he said, um, "How much of this are you going to be talking about 10, 20 years from now?" Um, and I paused for a second, and I had a, an epiphany, and I and I said, I, "I'm unfortunately." going to be talking about the same exact things because um, it isn't going to change <laughs> because what I was trying to do at the time was treat an athlete who already went through their developmental cycle and is now a, a highly talented athlete but with very poor skill okay and so I saw it as well it's the it's the here and now it's a now problem it's it, um, I need to fix the now but what he did for me and he, he allowed me to think outside that box a little bit and, he's, and I, I began to think right away that really it's not a now problem. It's not that 20 year old that's trying to make it to the Olympics or a division one athlete. It's really a kid manifested into a bigger issue when he aged up and, uh, and 
the intensity, density, and duration of his activity got large. Stress levels are high. He's in college. He's not see, sleeping. They're drinking. They're doing stuff that they they're doing stuff that a normal college does, and then they have problems. So um, um, I stood that, and I said, "Oh my gosh." And then I, the second story to connect the dots was um, in the, probably the last five years with clinically speaking, I, I've been seeing a lot of kids and it's because I see a lot of uh, runners, these kids come into me and they even come into me at a very young age. So this mother brings this kid in, he's 10 years old and he has back pain. He can't perform PE, he's having hard time. Um, as he comes in, as I evaluate him, um, and um, his pa both parents bring him in, um, it was clear to me that um, there was absolutely nothing wrong with this kid um, from a basic structural standpoint. He just didn't have the tools or the environment to develop as he was designed to develop. So he couldn't squat, he couldn't skip, he couldn't stand on one leg. Um, he couldn't do basic, basic things that should have been developed before the age of five. So he couldn't do um, any of those things, and there was functionally nothing wrong with him. Yeah, there, there was really nothing, again, there's really nothing wrong with him at all. Um, so um, as I built a relationship with this kid, I, really the issue that was very profound for me and that connected the dots for me was that um, his back wasn't as really a big of an issue to go to PE as um, a pre-adolescent going into adolescence um, and running and awkwardly and his female counterparts um, passing him by and it, it really became this confidence and self-esteem and, and a psychosocial issue combined with this physical issue combined with this this environmental issue um, that was a, is, is a storm waiting to be destructive not only from a physical long-term standpoint but also cognitively it has huge ramifications. Um, so tell I stuck him on a treadmill. Jeff, tell us a little bit about that. What do you mean by cognitive implications? Where, where the? I mean, I understand the self-esteem and I understand the physical part. Give, give yeah, me the so the, um, there's there's wonderful there's wonderful research uh, all over the place. A big place out of the University of Illinois, um, Champaign Urbana. Dr. Hillman does a lot of work and looks at um, the effects of exercise on um, cognitive function in young kids and how it lights up the prefrontal cortex and it gets them to be more creative and it increases their attention span and and um, they're able to their their behavior and and it's profound. Um, there's so in other tons. Words, when, kids, when kids are physical, that lights up their brain and makes them smarter, more creative, more powerful. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yes. And 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 there's tons of research. It's irrefutable. Yet we compare it within our current educational system because we actually are doing the opposite. We're making them sit there longer and and. Wow. We're not giving them what I call that cognitive primer anymore. Um, wow. We're not giving them the ability to um, solve interesting problems physically, cognitively, and, and emotionally. And then we're not giving them the ability to lead as well. Okay. So at the core of this whole process... I don't want to lose him. To... You were telling me about your, your boy that you were working with, so I wanted to hear that story too, Jeff. I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah, so to continue with that um, story is, is um, I stuck him on the treadmill and I wanted to watch him run and watch him, watch him run back and forth on, on land. And, and, the, and the kid literally could not run more than 30 to 45 seconds without his heart rate going up to 180 beats per minute. And any kid at 10 years old, should be able to run around almost constantly without really ha having a problem. I mean, um, you know, they should be able to fall off a roof at that age and be okay. I mean, they should be extremely plastic and resilient at that age. But be because the environment to do so physically, uh -huh. um, his system, his the organism just adapted to 
the environment, which was inactivity, ability, confidence, fundamental movement skills, and what have you. Yeah. Um, there again, I, I want to make the point that, that there's absolutely nothing wrong with this kid. It was given the environment that wasn't conducive to the organic development of the organism or him. It's really important to understand. now as he ages up and as he becomes an adolescent, as he becomes adult, then it's going to become a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we kid on, went on to this kid went on to um, through his treatment, his his ability to develop fundamental movement skills, went on to be able to run a seven minute mile pace um, easily. His confidence level grew. His ability to interact socially with me Wait, became this kid who could not, a kid who could not more, run um, 30 seconds on the treadmill without 180 beats a minute was now running a yeah. seven minute mile um, and people ask me well what did you do um, what did you I'm asking and, you what um, I did nothing but create an environment to allow his organism to adapt appropriately. That's it. Like, it it's not rocket science. Well, what like, did you do? I just let him be a kid. I let him be a kid, which requires play, uh -huh. which requires fun, which requires being outside and exploring his environment physically. And as a result of that, not only does his physical literacy increase, but his, his interaction, his psychosocial component, his behavior at school, his, his behavior with his parents, those components that are interfactorial became so much more um, positive. Um, so, and I think you probably understand this more than I do. Someone must have taken his uh, his Netflix away or his computer away. How how did you get him to go outside, goof around, and be a kid? He had very um, um, he had very involved parents. So they were separated, but they were also um, very concerned with regards to his development, and and, and so um, they created the environment with him, and they became more more actively kind of did the stuff with him um, and if they made it fun and I made I tried to make it fun for him um, because it's important for it to be fun at that age <laughs> uh, because um, I hate that I hate the word exercise because exercise can know, um, sometimes is related to work um, and for me exercise is just a small box or a small circle in a larger circle called movement and so our life is our is X correctly, um, and so um, giving him the ability to do things that he enjoys, but in an environment that allows his system to physically thrive, was was more important to me. I had him run, um, um, and I had him run very consistently. <laughs> um, um, so um, I think that was again. Um, something that's really important to me, but again, I didn't. I want to make the point that um, I just created a positive environment for his his organism to to develop like it should have. Okay. Okay. Well, that's uh, that that's a very hopeful story out of um, out of a uh, painful story, and you're saying that this is now something that is uh, endemic to our youth. And one thing that I think you shared about with me before is. Sometimes by youth being too involved with a singular activity repetitively and not having a breadth of activity to engage, that they'll once again not develop the full, uh, the full range of motion and activities that are natural to them, but now they're over-focused on perhaps um, you know, starting in Little League camps, uh, fall ball, winter ball, summer ball, and of course spring ball, and then that's what they become baseball players and they can develop problems even out of that. Is that, is that did, I, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, 100 percent. You know, it, um, um, there's a cognitive learning theory, there's a, there's a 
motor learning theory called dynamic. The system self-organizes in a very defined way, positively or negatively. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if we do anything too much of one thing without variability, um, mm -hmm. um, we're going to have problems. Um, if, if I take my right knuckle mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. all day long and bang it on the ground, mm -hmm. um, my right, right knuckle isn't going to feel very good over time. <laughs> now, is there something wrong with my right knuckle? No. But I lifestyle that mm -hmm. I'm pitching and throwing a ball as a young kid throughout a whole year with very little rest or very little variability. So um, um, these kids become really talented, and I need people to understand that skill does not equal talent. So these kids become very talented, but they're physical literacy can be very low e even in the in the um, talent wow. so we see these I kids, talent, low physical literacy yeah so we see these kids being um, very young and be very successful but their ability to be resilient over time is very poor and resiliency mm -hmm. over time equals performance it's mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. mm -hmm. running mm -hmm. You're going to get good because you don't stop the process, <laughs> and mm -hmm. your 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 is variable, um, and in terms of movement, um, and at a young age, it's really important. So some of the best athletes in the world were were finding um, played multiple sports, did lots of different things. They didn't specialize into one sport until later on, and almost in uh, towards the end of their high school career. Uh -huh. So um, delaying that specialization analysis. is important. And, but isn't yeah. that like exactly the opposite that parents believe? That if I don't get my kid uh, doing this at yeah, yeah, nine, they're screwed? Yeah, because there's too much money involved now um, um, in club sports and, and travel baseball. and It's big business, and, and – um, it's hard to step back and say, you know what, my kid doesn't need to do that. Um, mm -hmm. and initially, they may see a drop off in their in their performance mm -hmm. in their talent, so to speak. But mm -hmm. on the long run, their training age is going to be lower when it really matters. Wow. So an example of this is is me when I was in China. Um, they everything's government run, state run, um, and um, they get athletes. They pull athletes out early, ten years old. I saw a rhythmic gymnast there at eight, um, working out two days, two times a, a day, um, every day for whatever. And so um, they're they ten years old. They they already trained for ten plus years in in one specific sport. Um, their training age is very large. Um, but their chronological age is still really low. So their ability to withstand the amount of work that they've done continuous long term is very poor uh -huh. mm -hmm. because they've already, they've already done so much in such a short amount of time at such a young age with multiple injuries and what have you that I saw a race walker who happens to be fourth in the world took six in the London Olympics, amazing athlete, amazing human being. Um, <laughs> she's already been trained. She's 21 years old, maybe less than that, already been trained for 10 years, um, has a lot of problems physically, and and she, she has maybe one Olympics left in her, Rio, but she's only 20. She'll be 22 years old. Um, and physically, um, she's throughout her lifespan. That's going to be a bit of a problem. So um, um, it isn't to that that extreme sometimes here in the United States because our system is a little different. Um, but the print. I want kids to be. I want kids to have fun. I want them not to do practice that's skill based until later on in their their um, preteen, late preteen, early teenager, late teenage years. Okay, Jeff, I want I them to do variable. 
and, and okay. I think we've do got a question coming in. I think we've got a question coming in from uh, from Robin. Robin, have you got a question or two for us? Yes, I do, and this is uh, really interesting, and it makes me want to drill down and uh, learn so much more about what you're talking about. One of the questions that I have is. Um, what do you, what do you, what's the real message for families now, for people who have kids who are really at that young age, you described the 10 year old as having problems that he should have not had probably when he was four or five, certain developmental things should have happened. So what should parents be doing besides signing their kids up for, for team sports and you know, seeing them as great, but really sort of highly functioning and not low and low functioning at the same time. What should parents do to raise their kids to have the right foundation, fitness-wise? Now, yeah. So, really, I think let me explain it and and try to give you guys a better mental picture of what that looks like. And and really, it's about. You've, you've, you've heard me use the, the term environment a lot um, uh, because as I look at things from many different directions, whether it's the cognitive or the psychosocial or the physical my direction, or it really comes down to creating environments and not thinking in, in a reductionist way. So if I draw a big circle, and that big circle represents the environment, what we live in. And then within that circle is us, the organism, or the child. And within the organism is their body, brain, right? Their nervous system, okay? Um, and when within that, that construct is three other circles. And so, so it's the physical component, motor component, okay? The ability to perform tasks in a very uh, efficient way. The cognitive component, our educational system. The psychosocial component, which is a combination of like everything. And where those guys meet defines a very small circle. And that's called adaptation, or I like to call it adaptive behavior. Because it's really what, what I'm interested in is creating behaviors that, that, that are a result of adaptation of that whole system. Mm -hmm. So sure. when a parent comes to me and says, yeah, so what you're saying is you want the the cognitive, the psychosocial, the physical, um, you want all those things optimized. Yeah, you, 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 yeah, you really, we're, we're so good as a culture of separating everything. Hmm. Education, only focusing in on the cognitive component of things, but you cannot separate the cognitive, physical, and psychosocial. It's impossible. They're all connected. And the benefits physically for the cognitive are profound. The benefits physically for the psychosocial are profound. And if you combine all those, you have a star. <laughs> but if you, and I, I'm not out, if you leave the physical out, you hurt the other two profoundly. Yeah, so like... Yeah, exactly. If you if you if you rob something from the other, then the other and, and you might be good at one area, but overall you're going to be not moving in the direction necessarily that you want to move in. Yeah, this is really for people to understand because move to thrive is really about not building athletes. Not that's kind of where I came from. <laughs> um, it's really not about making someone physically more gifted. It's really about creating an environment in our educational system that combines all three systems. That is human life. That's, that's, that allows for sustained um, growth and, and throughout our lifespan. It's really like we, we have to think outside of, of the reductionism of, of our culture and look and take a step back and look at the bigger picture. It wasn't until I did that that like I almost fell over and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to build an athlete at a time when like um, it's not too late, but it should have been done already. 
and I'm trying to only do it in one circle, but I can't separate the other two. So in, in my field, one of the biggest limiters of an athlete isn't the physical component, but it's their mental state. You get you. We we look at preparedness and readiness, and they're not the same. Someone can be a comp extremely prepared to do something, but not ready mentally. Mm -hmm. So they step to the start line of a race, and the logical um, parameters necessary to achieve the task that they're trying to achieve, but never achieve to do that. Mm -hmm. So we build athletes, but we don't build them sometimes psychosocially, cognitively, um, and so they fail. Athlete the athlete needs to be a athlete. The best athletes in the world. The great yeah. athlete needs so, to be a person, whole person. Yeah, like the best athletes in the world that I know have the, the best minds. And they're not always prepared the best, but they're mentally ready. They step on the line and they do three things really well. They are in the moment, they accept feedback internally and externally, and they say yes to the challenge, and then they do it. Done. Mm -hmm. So um, That's, That sounds simple, it sounds, uh, it sounds difficult to master. Yeah, it's, it, that's making the complex very simple, <laughs> but it's extremely difficult, and we call it the flow state, and, and kids, giving kids an understanding of what it's like to, to have growth mindset and not be fixed in terms of how they do things is really important. And, um, okay. um, I'm, Jeff, we've got a, a question coming in. It is, uh, what about move to, what is move to thrive about? What, what is, what is that program about? Jeff? Yeah. Move to thrive is really a multifactorial program that, that, um, we're doing that I'm that I'm creating right now with people that are smarter than me um, um, in the educational system and and why it needs to be in the educational system is because um, um, every kid has access to that um, regardless of who they are and where they come from um, well they're there for hours every day yes and it's the only place that I know that I can have influence on every single kid at large without creating an after school, whatever. Um, and so every kid is in this situation. I don't have control over what they do at home. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have control over how their family raises them. But they're in, within a system is the, the educational system. There's a period of time every single year, a hundred and some odd days a year, whatever that comes out to be. I don't know. Maybe we can control that environment, and we can create an environment where we allow for physical literacy to thrive. We social component combined with the cognitive component because they're all together. Um, um, and and it's it's about creating that environment and the greatest thing and the weirdest thing that I'm going to say today is that not only is it about creating different curriculums, but it's it's about creating structure at large to look completely different than the way we know it now. So, wow. So I mean, part of my team is a is an architect um, who did his thesis at MIT, and and his thesis was on creating um, a structural, physical environment um, within the LA, LA Unified School District that allows for play and organic development of the physical system to occur naturally based on the structure that he built for, the, for that school. And you're not talking so just this about, is profound. You're not talking just about kindergarten. You're talking about K twelve. K through no K through um, six. K is, six is my most important group. Okay. And that's where de most development occurs the most. Okay. So not only is it was it um, uh, for um, 
the physical development of the child, but it was also a, a component of that cognitive component, N understanding that movement increases cognitive behavior, increases um, the ability of the, the, the child to critically think. Um, um, so it, there's those two components. So I'm taking my understanding of movement creating another system um, that allows for those fundamental sc movement skills to be developed and physical literacy to improve, but completely thinking outside the box and also want to create the structure around that child, which is the organism, and put him in an environment that is also going to allow that to do it from a structural standpoint. The cognitive benefits are, are profound. The psychosocial benefits are profound. Um, and this can be done um, if, if, if someone is crazy <laughs> um, and, and it sounds crazy. Um, no one's doing that right now. Well, you know, no it's it, combined it, all those components. It doesn't they're, sound crazy. They're, they're, it doesn't sound crazy. It sounds radical. It sounds, it, and, and it's, and part of my, to me, that's part of my mission is to yeah. basically radically restructure the educational system as we know it wow. and it's not just about the physical because it's not about I don't want to think in terms of reductionism it's not about just the motor component it's not about just being able to move like a good athlete but that athlete has a mind and that body lives in a world or environment right. and those two are in all those three components are inseparable Mm -hmm. And if you combine that that perfect system, mm -hmm. the output of that is going to be pretty profound. Wow, that is and it's that is it's, a, it's amazing to think about that. Um, um, it seems complex, but if you really step back and think about it, it isn't. It's not. And everybody from neuroscience to performance on my end, physical performance, they're all speaking the same language, but they're coming at it from their own expertise that they're all connected. Mm -hmm. Absolutely all connected. Mm -hmm. So so instead of uh, climbing trees, we're on smartphones. Instead of swimming in the swimming hole, we're, uh, we're in our basements playing uh, video games. Is that part of it, Jeff? Absolutely part of it. Um, there's, there's obviously certain things that are not going to be controllable, um, but I think a lot of it is, is a lot of what I do with my patients is just educate. Mm -hmm. So, and you know that, Neil, and, and really, like, sometimes if you just give parents a little education and get them to see it in a way that they understand, mm -hmm. um, a lot can be changed, um, and that's what that's one of them is. And just understanding that that we live in a world of convenience, mm -hmm. and it's the inconvenient world that allows for appropriate adaptation. Sometimes, so I always want my kids to <laughs> feel slightly inconvenient before convenient. Um, um, I want them to be independent, not dependent. Mm -hmm. Let me let me let me. Um, Say that again. I want kids to learn to be deep in, independent, not dependent upon stuff. Okay. Um, independent. Um, inconvenience. Want to be able to use their own resources. Learning because inconvenience allows for exploration and allows the kid to solve interesting problems from simple to complex. Mm. And that's at the that's at the heart of what Move to Thrive is all about. Is it's really just giving kids the the understanding and the environment to allow them to solve physical problems and let them self-organize in a way that's appropriate for the organism. But if I replace that physical with cognitive and psychosocial, mm -hmm. it's the same. Okay. So well, Jeff, if, I, if you replace, if you replaced every word I said with cognitive, or if you replaced every word I said from a movement standpoint with psychosocial components, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, 
yeah, I want a kid to learn cognitively answers. I don't want it to be convenient for them. I want them to solve the problem because that facilitates better learning and re mm -hmm. retention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. um, it's not so, different. But, but, so that, that uh, challenges parents to watch, let their kids be uncomfortable because parents want to put a want to tie a pillow around their butt and put a helmet on their head and make sure that they're safe and protected and feel good uh, all the time. But what you're yeah, saying, you know, it's it's it's, let, let it's okay solve. to fall. Let it, it's okay to. Fall. I mean, struggle is what facilitates learning and and what facilitates creativity and and like I want them to. It's okay to climb a tree and fall down. I guarantee they will survive. Okay. Um, it's okay to roll around, get dirty, and like, um, I'm. This is this has actually been hard for me. So this, this is good for me because I'm extremely obsessive compulsive, and I'm a I'm a clean freak, and so like, like I want everything perfect. But when I had two kids, that went completely out the door. Forget about um, and as I got more into this this cost, um, it really became an eye opener for me that hey, this development, this is important for them processing and being creative and mm -hmm. and uh, like this is they need to, to do this. Um, um, so um, okay. I think it's, that, it's we've uh, it's really important for parents to understand that. Okay, well we've used our time. And uh, and I found this uh, quite uh, quite amazing and and quite profound and uh, and it what it tells me is that we're going to have to make some major changes in our culture uh, to if what we want are smarter kids uh, and more prepared kids then we're also going to have to we're going to have to look at the whole kid and the environment in which that kid is growing so this has uh, been very eye opening. Uh, to me and I'm sure for our viewers and so I want to thank you uh, beyond words for for sharing this perspective and getting this movement going I know it starting a movement like this isn't doesn't pay well and uh, there's no really immediate reinforcement for your efforts other than you're doing the right thing and so I really want to offer my appreciation for what you're doing for all of us and our kids and I wonder if there's one last message that you want to put out there for uh, for families and and educators and uh, and our viewers. Yeah, I think I think the biggest message is is that understanding at the core of everything um, movement um, create an environment cognitive, physically, and psychosocially that allows the kid and the individual at any age adapt um, in a positive way that 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 can make them um, 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 a good component of our society and our culture and and um, um, and then um, you know we're, we're really really looking for that stand by us and has a larger voice and and give us and help us have the resources to really put this on a low larger scale. Okay. I mean, Once again, Jeff, thanks so much, and Robin, thank you so much for your uh, support and your production support. Anytime. All right. And I will say to our thank viewers, you. thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll look for you in the hopefully not too distant future. Bye for now. Thank you, Neil.